<laughs> well, we'll see. They say the third time's the charm, right? So we'll see if I can do it. <laughs> well, we'll figure it out. Okay. <coughs> Let's see. We've got, uh, why don't we just give it another minute or two? Okay. That's fine. Oh, Jeff, while we're waiting, I wanted to tell you that I've consulted two other biologists and so far two psychiatrists about your question of whether or not instinct is, uh, is, is genetic. And um, mm -hmm. I just got a response back from one of, one of Mary Miller's friends this morning. And there's a couple of references on there that I will send you about that. It, it's sort of debatable. Mm -hmm. there, um, a lot of the folks seem to think that it does seem to be genetic. Others seem to think there's some learned behavior that goes in there. So anyway, I will, I will send you those references. Okay, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh -huh. Interesting. Uh -huh. Sue, how's your recovery going? Well, it turned out doing a little better last night. I was not taking enough pain medicine. It was about to kill me. And last night I said, I'm going to take a whole one of these. And I did real well. So I think I just need to do more. My daughter kept saying, Mama, don't take much of that. Try to get off of that. Well, I got on more pain and more pain. <laughs> so I've changed the way I'm doing that. I hated to miss last Sunday, uh, Julie. I've done this with you for years and you always do such a good job but I just couldn't do it last uh, week I hope that's recorded some way is it Brian I see Brian right there in Wallace it is I think you jumped on after I, uh, I mentioned that this morning um, we have recorded each of Julie's sessions and are recording again today and those are on our church YouTube channel um, and the individual sessions are posted on our Facebook page so uh, if you want to go back and watch them, you should be able to find them. If you can't have or have a hard time finding it, just let me know and I can send you a direct link too. But. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. And Thank especially you for asking. I'm, I'm doing better today. Go ahead, Julie. Do especially if you're having trouble sleeping, those talks will put you right to sleep. So. <laughs> yes. Ryan, don't laugh so loudly. It really helps because I've not been sleeping well. I, it sounds like you're trying to horn in on my territory now, Julie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I learned from the best. Sleep aids. So. <laughs> Jane, Jane, I love your background. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see it. When I was in Columbia last week, a friend's grandson got playing with the backgrounds oh. and it stayed. That's fabulous. <laughs> well, David, shall we start? Because I want to leave plenty of time for some discussion a little bit later. Okay. I made you the co-host. And okay. so uh, you should have the ability to share your screen and All take it right. away. Let's give it a shot here. All See right. If we can do this thing. Look at that. Here we go. Sure. Look at that. And well, don't brag yet. We're not there yet. <laughs> um, Tribute to the elasticity of the brain. But she learned how to do something. Mm -hmm. well, okay. I'll be so glad when we're back in person. <laughs> Okay. Well, you can scroll down to uh, the slide. That I see. On. Okay. I just now saw it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> All right, folks. Welcome back. Um, we are into the last Sunday of Evolution Sunday for 2021. And as you know, we've been talking about the basics of evolution the first Sunday. Last week, we started looking at how we have gone from natural selection to unnatural selection. And if you will excuse me here, I will move down. That's a quick review for those of you that can read fast. 
<laughs> I, I would ask everyone to put themselves on mute. There's often a lot of extraneous noise that you don't realize. I'm not seeing the screen. Is everyone else? Yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we've been looking at, as I said, the ways in wh which natural selection as Char Charles Darwin viewed it has changed to unnatural selection and non-random mutations as our environmental influences have impacted our genome and started to modify those genes in ways that can be inherited. Now, one of those that has actually been ongoing for a while now is genetic engineering. This is not new. It, it's been around for quite a while, considering that we have viruses that inserted themselves into our DNA. At least 8% of our genome is virus code, virus code. So as I said in a previous talk, we are symbionts. We live with bacteria. We live with viruses. They're part of our overall makeup and part of what makes us human. But these viral changes that occur, occur basically through Darwinian natural selection. They are deliberately changing our DNA. And um, a neutered virus is usually used here. It is, it's a virus that is rendered harmless and therefore new genetic instructions can be introduced into that virus. And that virus is then inserted into animals where it can modify the genome of that particular animal. And when you think of it, uh, many of us in this uh, group are old enough to remember the first IVF baby, the first in vitro fertilization baby. That one's now 37 years old. And of course, you know, we hear a lot about genetically modified foods and organisms. Um, and when you think of what we've done to our plants, to our crops, so many now are genetically modified. You want those bigger, juicier tomatoes. You want that luscious corn. You want all of those things that taste so good. And so many have been gen genetically modified. This has been a sort of a form of artificial selection like we did with the dogs that we talked about at the beginning, except here you're actually going in and modifying the actual genetics of many of these crops. Now in this one, you see some applications of some of the genetic engineering that has occurred. The strawberry that you see on the right has had antifree injected into it. Now this is an antifreeze that is a naturally occurring antifreeze, so don't freak out. Um, many of the fish that live in very cold water actually have in their blood a chemical that is the equivalent of what we know as antifreeze. And this particular gene was taken and inserted into some strawberries so that when they are frozen, they won't come out mushy. Um, you see at the bottom right, chickens that have been genetically modified so that they can live in desert situations. They have less or fewer feathers so they can live in the desert. And Wallace, the picture in the center is just for you. Now, I want you to promise me, Wally, that you will not do this to Taylor, your cat. Um, I know you don't need to do it to Daisy because golden retrievers have their own inner light, so they don't really need this type of modification. But this is an, a fluorescent gene that is found in many deep sea organisms that is used for seeing, basically, because it's pretty dark at the bottom of the ocean. And this type of fluorescent gene has been activated or inserted in some animals. And in fact, in the next diagram or the next picture, you see a green rabbit, but it's green only under black light. This one was genetically engineered way, way, way back in 2000. And as you can see, this one, the genes for this one, the fluorescent proteins came from a jellyfish so that this particular rabbit will glow in the dark under black light. 
Then in recent years, probably about the last five to 10 years, there was a major revolution that occurred that basically speeded up the process of genetic engineering in to, to many of the things that we're seeing today. And that involved the enzyme system CRISPR-Cas9. This is a system that's found in every ancient bacterial genome study, every ancient bacterial genome. And as we know, these go back 500 million years and beyond. Some of them go back to the three billion year a point of the beginnings of, of this particular planet. It is part of their immune system that allows the microbes to fight off the viruses. The viruses invade the cells. And with this system, they can get rid of this particular um, gene that is about to be inserted into, their, into the bacterial genome. Now, the word CRISPR means clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. <laughs> that, that's why you use the acronym CRISPR because it's so much easier to say. Uh, a palindrome, as you know, is a word that's spelled the same forward or backwards, like the word ABBA is spelled the same whether it's forwards or backwards. And there are a series of these that are found in the DNA and they found these particular clusters whenever they were trying to make a better yogurt product. Now yogurt, most of us have eaten. You know that it provides many ben beneficial bacteria for our GI tracts. And the viruses were contaminating the yogurt, yogurt product and destroying many of the good bacteria. So the bacterial DNA was sequenced and they found the site where the viruses were actually attacking the DNA of the bacteria. Viruses need the bacteria to reproduce. So the bacteria that had the CRISPR sequences were using those to edit the viral genome. That is, they were cutting out the bad sequence and they were adding a harmless code. This technique, remember, is hundreds of millions of years old because bacteria used it as a survival mechanism to fight off the viruses that were infecting their DNA. Think of it as the biological version of Norton or McAfee antiviral programs for computers, because this CRISPR is basic, has become a, an empowering technology with broad implications, as we'll see, in both basic science and clinical medicine. And this, this is basically what happens. You see here at the top, you see this virus that is invading the bacterial cell. And it is about to insert a product into the CRISPR sequence of the bacteria. So what this does is to activate the CRISPR RNA, which goes over and cuts out the, back, the, the viral component and gets rid of it, basically destroys it. Um, I'm sorry, my way. So the CRISPR, has since been repurposed to cut, paste, and edit any DNA in any genome, any DNA. In other words, it can go in and remove a harmful sequence and replace it with a beneficial one. It's rapid, does large-scale gene editing, and can replace whole sets of genes. We have the power to recreate, edit, and collapse the three billion year saga of life on earth into a short documentary. We can modify the genes that quickly with this CRISPR. Now, any genetic mutation, man-made or natural, um, recent or ancient from any species can be recreated and introduced into a living cell. The result is the modification and evolution of humans. It's definitely unnatural, unlike anything we have encountered in our previous history. And again, here are a few of the ways in which this genetic engineering has been used. I mentioned the featherless chickens that they now have in Israeli de deserts that help them resist the heat. The glow-in-the-dark cats, not golden retrievers, just golden cats, um, fish, sheep, 
And this next one I kind of like. This is the uh, glow in the dark trees that might replace street lights at some point. That might be interesting. Drought resistant corn, mushrooms that don't turn brown, nutritionally enhanced crops, algae that can produce vaccines, fuel, and food, cells designed to uh, detect toxins that are in our water and, and such as estrogen and filter them out. And I love this one, the DNA sequence of the cacao tree was isolated to learn what makes chocolate taste so good. That, 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 that is good research right there. Um, strawberries released in 2015 are made sweeter and disease resistant. So we're basically rewriting the life code. Rapid evolution is real and it's getting faster with CRISPR. And what about those babies? Designer babies. Imagine designing your child to the point that you have, if you want the, the child to have perfect pitch and be a musician, if you want the child not to inherit baldness, if you want the child to have a high IQ, to be a sprinter or runner or whatever the athletic event is, to have low risk of diseases, to have perfect vision throughout life. Now, imagine being able to do that. It's kind of scary. But are there benefits to genetic engineering? There's work currently going on to modify mosquitoes so that they will not transmit malaria or Zika. It's, can it be used to eliminate the use of pesticides or get rid of, rid of invasive species? And this one was kind of interesting. A monogamy gene has been isolated in a bowl that you see at the bottom of the screen there. Um, that basically, what are the implications, human implications for that one? Um, <clears throat> we are responsible for the outcomes of our choices on how life evolves and how our species evolves. It's imperative that we address the ethical questions regarding the use of CRISPR and gene therapies because we may modify the genetic code of our descendants. What about medicinal uses? There are a few others here that are in the works, uh, such as removing HIV from infected human cells. The CETP gene can reduce the incidence of Alzheimer's disease by 69%. The DEC gene would enable us to only need six hours of sleep. The FOX03A gene uh, in Japanese Americans decreases the rate of cancer and heart disease. And in primates, regions of the brain affected by PTSD can be blocked to decrease stress and anxiety. But eliminating genes is risky because we don't know what else those genes do. With sickle cell anemia, we know, for example, that the genes that make uh, uh, this particular disease occur also protect us from malaria. Cystic fibrosis genes confer resistance to African sleeping sickness. Notice both of these diseases, malaria and African sleeping sickness occur in Africa where our species is believed to have originated. The CCR5 gene helps us resist HIV. So we have symbiotic relationships or symbiotic microbes whose relationship has been with us and played out over millions of years. And if, if, if these genes, basically, if we remove them, what else would happen? And this just shows you with the sickle cell anemia, what occurs here. The two parental figures here both carry the gene. The, 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 the sort of uh, pinkish color here, that's the recessive gene that they carry, but neither of them has sickle cell anemia. One in, in four children that they might have might be completely normal and not carry the gene. One in four of the children 
would, would have sickle cell anemia and, and probably die earlier. And then there are two offspring that would be carriers. The advantage here to being a carrier is that it helps you survive malaria if you get it. If an individual with sickle cell gets it or an individual with normal genetic makeup gets it, then they basically have a high risk of dying from the disease. So just carrying that gene, that recessive gene can make a difference in terms of health. How many others out there are like that? We don't know. And of course, you know, you could get a little carried away with genetic engineering if you wanted to. So what is our future? The future masters of the world will be more different from us than we are from Neanderthals. This next stage of human history will include not only technological and organizational transformations, but also fundamental transformations in human consciousness and identity. Humans will keep shifting evolution away from what nature would dictate and toward what we want. That is, unnatural selection and non-random mutations are here to stay. So how will we manage our extraordinary powers? We're in effect creating our own successors. Has evolution stopped with Homo sapiens, our species? Will we become stronger and fitter, giving rise to superhumans? Is this the purpose of genetic engineering? Yuval Harari, the author of Sapiens and Homo Deus that I know some of you have read, proposes that Homo sapiens has run its historical course, taking us from hunter-gatherers to creatures that have spread to all parts of the world and who amass huge quantities of information and data on everything. Will we use that amassed information to create Homo Deus, who is a much superior human model? Homo sapiens made us rulers of the planet. Will Homo Deus make, take us to unimaginable new realms and make us rulers of the galaxy? In the future, powerful drugs, genetic engineering, electronic helmets, and direct brain computer interfaces may open passages to the future. Just as Columbus and Magellan sailed beyond the horizon to explore new lands and unknown continents, we may one day embark on such a journey into the mind. Is that where we're headed? Or are we dabbling in eugenics? Eugenics, of course, as you know, has happened many times in our human history, even in this country, for a number of years. Is that where we're headed with this particular process? We have to remember diversity. Diversity has always been and remains the sole survival strategy for our species and others. And that diversity requires random mutations to, to the environment, there's that word again, to help the, those with the right adaptation survive. As Darwin said, the differential survival of favored variants. Think of what 8,000 years of domesticating corn to increase yield has done. It's now so genetically uniform that it is more susceptible to disease. Some genetic equality is part of being human and is the key to our diversity. We don't want complete genetic equality or we would be clones. Transhumanists, that is man remaining man but dis transcending himself by realizing new possibilities for humanity, imagine a world where humans transcend the limitations of our current biology. Genetic engineering is the future of humanity, but it must be regulated by, by ethical constraints. All of these new gene editing technologies will be viewed differently by our different cultures, histories, and political structures. 
the result is a wide variety of legal and regulatory rules that will lead to both positive and negative outcomes. For 3.5 billion years, our ancestors outcompeted others for survival. Now, many of our genetic changes will not be random and based on natural environmental changes, but will be self-directed and unnatural. Our heredity is an ancient code that is understandable, readable, writable, and hackable. We now have the capability to alter that code as we hacked Darwin. Thank you for joining International Darwin Day, but I want to end as we began, just by looking at some of the beliefs in evolution in this country. This is a study run by the, the Pew Foundation in 2019. 81% of US adults believe that humans have evolved over time. 33% of these believe the process was natural selection. 48% believe the process was guided by God. Among white evangelical Protestants, only 4% believe in natural selection. And 38% believe that humans have always existed in their present form. White mainline line Protestants, 30%, favor natural selection. Catholics 30%, have 30% favoring natural selection, while 56% say that natural selection was guided by God. Among those that are unaffiliated with churches, 64% favor natural selection. Among AAAS scientists, 98% believe that humans have evolved over time. So is this why everybody's so afraid of science? <laughs> I, I think it's unfortunate that most individuals tend to regard science and religion as totally separate entities. When I think the two basically support each other, if you look at, look at it from, from that perspective. So what I want to do now is to, um, open the top for questions, your thoughts. Uh, is everybody on mute? Mute. I think everybody's on mute. I, I'm, I'm unmuted. I'll, I'll uh, throw, I've got well, so many questions, Julie, but um, I, uh, um, two I want to, I'll throw out. Um, so one is one, is a question that I just would love to hear your in, insight on, and it's one I, I texted you after last week, but it was, uh, uh, came to me after reading uh, the Sapiens book um, that you referenced just a few moments ago, uh, fascinating read. Um, and um, you have all uh, notes in, in that um, kind of talking about the agricultural revolution and the genetic changes that took place in uh, Homo sapiens as a result of the agricultural revolution. One of the things he noted in there, and uh, this is on page 83, I was trying to find a quote I could read that kind of summarized my question here. And he, he writes that if no more DNA copies remain, then the species is extinct, right? Just as a company without money is bankrupt. If a species boasts many DNA copies, it is a success and the species flourishes. So from that perspective, a thousand copies are always better than a hundred copies. This is the essence of the agricultural revolution, the ability to keep more people alive, but under worse conditions. And that was such a fascinating paradox to me to think that um, kind of the, the goals from a genetic standpoint are more copies of DNA code, even if what that results in is a reduced life expectancy, a reduced quality of life for the, the humans that that DNA code, you know, in, in codes. Um, and I, I thought that was just, it, it almost feels like kind of the, the goal of 
evolution from a purely genetic standpoint um, is at odds somewhat with the goal of a, a higher quality of life for the individuals that that genetic code, you know, I don't know. Does that question make sense at all, Julia? Do those two things, the way you presented it, it seemed like those things were at odds, like the agricultural revolution led to my genetic code being able to, you know, reproduce a lot better, but my resultant quality of life went downhill from kind of the hunter gatherers that preceded it with a more diverse diet and, and other things that the agricultural revolution did away with. Okay, well, when, when you think of, of natural selection, you think of survival. That's the goal is survival. And to survive, you also have a certain genetic makeup that allows you to survive, that has gotten you to that point. And therefore, when you reproduce, you pass those genes on to the next generation to help enhance their particular survival. And I think probably what happened here was that when the hunter-gatherers kind of faded away and started living in organized groups, maybe there were less pressures for that survival that was there when they were out having to fend for themselves and that um, the access to mates was more readily available at that point. So um, I'm not exactly sure what he is getting at in that particular, in that particular instance, but it mm. all comes down to survival and that particular DNA that is most efficient at doing that. Anybody else have some ideas on that? I uh, uh, was struck by the Brian's use of the word uh, goal, and mm. and your Julie use of the term in order to genes are passed down in order to, and uh, in the strictest sense, and I feel like I'm the skunk that just walked into the room. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, uh, yes. that evolution doesn't have goals. There, there, are, there are no goals. Evolution is not purpose driven. It, it, that what happens with successive species are merely consequences, merely, sorry, weasel word, that what species are, are successful essentially because they're successful. There's no intent to create a more successful species or a less successful species. Okay, I see where you're going. It's driven by, you know, natural selection that what works persists, but there's no purpose. Yeah. And that, and that in and of itself is one of the reasons, I think, why people have so much trouble accepting evolution is that, you know, in the strict sense, it, it, it's not guided. It doesn't have a goal. It's not going somewhere definitive. Uh, it doesn't have a purpose. Uh -huh. No, and, and that's fair, David. My use of the word goal was probably a it was probably a poorly chosen word. Um, the, People the, do it all the time. I've heard the best scientists in the world. Well, you know, we all do. We, we you know, we all lapse into thinking about the purpose and the goal of evolution. I mean, I've heard Richard Dawkins do it. Um, it, it, because we're so naturally inclined to think that way. And evolution tells us no. And maybe that's the difference in science and religion, in a way, you know. Well, yeah, that's a pretty good point. Uh, well, evolution perpetuates and, 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 and encourages change um, because the environment changes. And therefore, in order for that species to survive, it has to change with the environment. And, and that change it, it is, is driven by evolutionary forces that act on the DNA. And it seems to me that when you say survive, you, you really mean survive to reproduce. Yes. Once a species has reproduced, then that particular person or, or animal is no longer necessary, particularly. <laughs> yes, 
And, and so then that's a, I think that's a real significant point too, because diseases that affect people in middle age and in old age are, are not going to be selected against. Exactly, exactly. And the re cancer in your reproductive organs, you know, usually happens way after you've, uh, you know, reproduction. And, and also when you think about humans are one of the few animals that um, cease to reproduce and, and continue to live. For many organisms, they, they, they will continue to reproduce throughout their lifespan. And we reach a certain point where we no longer do that. And, and as our lifespan has increased due to better medicine, due to better health, uh, foods, better health, um, then we, we live where, where many other species would normally die after they can no longer reproduce. But we're still um, in our social structure, the elders are still necessary yes. or are beneficial to the survival of their children, grandchildren. Yes, because we are a social species. Yeah. But if you look at organisms that simply come together to mate, the, the male then takes off and is gone, the female raises the offspring and then the offspring is gone, um, you know, and there's no social group, then there's not a, a selective pressure for to have those those very wise grandparents and parents around. To me, evolution is an unfolding of reality. This happens, then that happens, and then there's something new. Or this happens, that happens, there's something that turns out better but it just all unfolds over time as to where we are now and all these things that have happened. And to me, that's the unity of spirit and science that within all of this, all of those things are taking place. It moves in the spirit and it, and it also uh, moves in the scientific facts and ideas. And then we realize what's happening. That's just what came to me. One of my one of my good friends at Milligan um, was a Bible professor, and I asked him once what he thought of evolution, and he thought for a minute. And most of you've heard me say this before. He basically said evolution evolution tells us where, when, how, and why. He said religion. I'm, I'm sorry, where, when, and how. Religion tells us why, why we're here. And so he had no conflict. He had no conflict with the two. But of course, as you know, many, many folks do. I mean, the E word is about as bad as the A word uh, for abortion. Um, they just simply shut down when, when those words are mentioned. Well, what happens is they choose it to be a certain way that they think, which is not reality. So those that don't believe or think it's wrong, they just are having a big battle with reality, <laughs> with life. I, I like that, Julie. And uh, uh, you know, that it, does, it doesn't tell us the why. And, and you know, in fact, in strict scientific terms of looking through the lens of evolution, there is no why, mm -hmm. right? There, isn't, there, is, there are antecedent whys uh, because why can be interpreted two ways, you know, why meaning how did this happen and why meaning what's the future purpose of it. And so we, you know, we're just imbued with this uh, incredible need to have purpose. I mean, you know, we, I think we all feel that, you know, we want uh, purpose and meaning in our lives, but nature doesn't necessarily provide it we create it and and a religion is one of the vehicles that we use to find meaning and find purpose yeah. and it's a, you know how important is that to us well how many churches are there in johnson city a lot yeah because we you know we we want that mm -hmm. so um i mean this this shifts here's a little bit julie but the uh, other one that really I, was very personal to me as you were talking about it is in, in this uh, 
our ability more and more to be able to unnaturally select, you used uh, in, in your slides the word ethics or ethical implications or reflecting on the ethics of it came up multiple times. Uh -huh. um, and the, the first thought I had is, you know, once, once we begin to really be able to, you know, encode a designer baby, for example, um, my thought is, well, that's technology that is right off the bat going to be available to those with resources to pay for that. Um, and as soon as you begin that, then you, I mean, you, you really have a, um, you know, it, 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 you had a graphic where you had, I think it was uh, homo deus and homo useless, right? Mm -hmm. and, and when you begin genetically encoding children, you, you have, you know, started that, that divergence. But there's going to be a strong correlation, I think, in that divergence with between wealth and everybody else. Um, and, and there are some serious ethical ramifications to that, to me. And I, I wonder both, are those, I, I have very little faith in capitalism, which I think will drive a lot of that to really have those conversations about the ethics of it. And um, so I'm curious if those conversations are happening and if so, what, it, are there any restraints being placed on the technology because of those, uh, those ethical questions at this point? And I, I guess I'm very skeptical of uh, the ethics of it being uh, um, a, a barrier to um, what I think you know, capitalism can drive the ability to create a designer baby that is superior to other kids and, you know, and the correlations of those children with wealthy elite and, and you know, what that looks like for the future of our, our culture and humanity. So uh, that's a really open-ended question, I think, but, um, I, you know, I, it's an area I haven't really given much thought to, but you you raised some questions about it this morning. To know if well, you know, we already have the problem in this country of the haves and the have-nots. We're seeing that now. But imagine what's going to happen when you do have those in individuals who can pay for those designer babies or, or pay to have, have certain genetic work done on themselves. Um, a lot of it, fortunately, in this country, much of it is regulated to a certain degree in terms of not allowing certain things to happen, such as stem cells a number of years ago, that those were, were very popular at one point. And, um, but in other countries like China, they've been using stem cells for years. They are making those designer babies. They are doing these things already in China. The, 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 um, the, the ethical restraints are, are not there in certain areas in certain countries. And that's what we're up against in terms of who, who gets the technology, who uses the technology in a way that can be beneficial. I mean, a lot of folks would like to see mosquitoes gone. You know, a lot of folks would like to see this, that, or the other. But when it comes down to it, you have to weigh what that's going to do to the environment as a whole or to the individual as a whole and how we're modifying our, our genetic makeup. To me, it, it, it's frightening just because it has taken us so many millions of years to get to where we are now and to come in and, and start changing within a matter of decades. We just, we, we're really, um, it, it's frightening in terms of what can be happening in the future, in, in the future. I, I think sometimes that, uh, you know, we, we, we are more technologically advanced than we are ethically advanced um, in, in our modifications. You know, I mean, it's, we, we just recently have been able to get rid of sickle cell anemia um, by stem cell, I think. Um, and I, I could see where any kind of modification that, let's say a modification to keep people from getting um, osteoporosis but also may have a side advantage of making um, your bones stronger, you know? And so you'd have an advantage as a young person athletically, you know, where, where do you draw the, the line, you know, between advancing something that, you know, is medically helpful versus uh, just 
you know, just an ecological advantage. Well, you also have to look at the pros and cons of whatever that technology is. For example, nuclear power. Nuclear power is being used in many parts of the country, country to, to provide electricity. But of course it was used for, for worse purposes in terms of designing bombs and, and, and warfare. Yeah. And so you have to look at any technology that's out there and try to regulate it according to the best possible uses for humanity. There, there have been some international conferences that have been held looking at genetic engineering and talking about the, the, the do's and the don'ts that are out there. But, you know, all you can do is, is offer those, those suggestions and then hope that the people in those countries abide by them. Well, we better do some praying for a raising of consciousness in a hurry. That sounds like religious talk, Lydia. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, <laughs> well, Young did say you, know, right. you have to have meaning in order to have a satisfying, you know, life. Mm -hmm. But even the question of uh, uh, what we do for food production, which has been hailed as feeding so many more people with uh, genetic engineering and fertilizers and such. But then more people, you know, that favors reproduction. And then you have more people that you cannot feed or are more susceptible to disease. All of these questions have, like you say, an, uh, 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 such a complexity mm -hmm. that it's hard to, to, to grapple with. And, and people will usually be just tending to pursue their own interest mm -hmm. i have a question for i i have a question uh, the uh, <clears throat> the covid uh, vaccine uh, was crispr used in the uh, in, in the manufacture or the development of that uh, those vaccines um i know it's, it involves rna right david and i'm pretty sure rna was used and if it was i would i would i would think that that crispr was probably involved at some point do you know specifics of that, David? I don't. Okay. No. Yeah. I have a question for you, Julie. I wouldn't be surprised, but uh, you know, RNA can be synthesized. You know, we, we have machines uh -huh. that, that can spit out sequences of RNA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But to go in and tweak it like they're doing now for these variants that are coming along, you know, with that, that could potentially involve CRISPR. It's, it's being used in more and more areas. Of, of the medical field. So it wouldn't surprise me if, it, if it's used at some point. Larry? Yeah, Julie, um, it, it, do I understand that species that have a social um, construct or a social aspect are more successful? Does that seem to correlate? Um, there's an awful lot of ants and honeybees out there um not necessarily it depends on it depends on um again what the environment around them is doing because if that environment changes like many of the the lion prides in africa you know those are being impacted by by hunting by environmental by climate change and so there's a lots of fa factors that can come into play but Logically, I would think that the more cooperation you have with raising those offspring, remember it takes a village, that that, that would enhance the survival of those offspring to, again, um, perpetuate the species. A, a follow-up question. Um, then whatever would enhance uh, the social structure or uh, might enhance the success of the species? Um, well, I, I, I would think that would be reasonable. In, in some, As it adapts to the environment. Yeah, yeah. So in some cases, you know, that's really true and evident, ants and bees being, you know, colonial mm -hmm. or social animals. But spiders mm -hmm. are extremely successful and they're solitary animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, how many spiders? Are they put out thousands of babies, thousands. So it's, you know. Yep. All that sibling rivalry. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's called fitness. That's called reproductive success. So, 
it seems to me that Larry's point is applicable, however, to humans, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're an extremely social species. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I do remember, this is Pat, I do remember reading a while back um, that uh, I think it was Evolution's Arrow. There was a couple interesting points. One was that people mis misinterpreted uh, Darwin's survival of the fittest, that they, that the author felt that what it really was was the, the species that cooperated the, together the best survives the best, whether it's you know the, the herd animals that would have scouts that, and that would alert if there was a predator nearby or uh, humans taking helping getting together and helping village the village helping raise children. The other point he had in there was circles back to something David said earlier about evolution having no purpose. And he made the, he made the case in a book about um, that complexity was like an inherent property of matter or reality or something that, um, and that consciousness was an emergent quality based on that complexity, but that from the big bang forward, that uh, evolution was driving, to, everything was evolving, if you would, to greater and greater complexity and evolution, genetic evolution was just one more piece of that, you know, uh, on a very personal level. <laughs> um, so that, they, he, so basically that there was a purpose to it, but it might not be a human type purpose or a God's guiding hand type purpose, but um, an inherent principle of the, the ground of being that we you know, all exist in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good, good point, good point. I'll go back to the fitness one first. In, in biological circles, you tend to think of fitness as reproductive success. We think of fitness today as being big and strong and going to the gym, you know, that's fitness. Fitness is not necessarily the survival of the biggest and the strongest, although that frequently does happen, but it's again, the one that produces the most offspring that gets those genes out into the, the, the environment, into, um, uh, the rest of, of the, the group and therefore perpetuates whatever it is that individual has that enables them to survive changing conditions. That's typically what fitness refers to. Um, as far as the complexity, certainly I think the more we learn about not only the environment, but certainly ourselves, it, we're, we're seeing more and more complexity that, that's there all the way down to the cell and molecular level that is just, is just mind blowing. And, and when I see that kind of complexity, it enhances my belief in a higher power out there somewhere, just simply because it is so, it's just amazing. It just blows my mind when I look at some of the, the construction that is there, um, even down at this genetic level. So um, there is complexity that's there, certainly, and we're learning more and more about it as we delve deeper and deeper into the unseen. Julie, um, yeah. when we're, we're talking, about, when we talk about social cooperation, is there any evidence for social cooperation in like reptiles and amphibians? Uh, this past week, I've been amazed at, at uh, egg masses for frogs I've been seeing out in the woods. And it, it looks like the frog strategy is just to produce an incredible amount of eggs and tadpoles. Um, but is there any social structure in, in, in among frogs or are they just solitary egg producers? That's, that, 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 that many of the, the reptiles and amphibians, not necessarily the reptiles as much, but the amphibians just produ produce quantity. There's just so many out there that, that a certain number will survive. Um, but I don't remember reading much about pair bonds forming in frogs. 
or uh, in, or salamanders or those groups. They pretty much lay the eggs and move on. Um, and with reptiles, it's a little bit, reptiles don't have to lay as many because they don't have to return to the water to do it. All right, they lay eggs that have uh -huh. shells on them. So they can bury those eggs. They can put them places where they'll be safe uh, from, from most predation. But again, there's now the female will stay and guard the nests in some reptiles, but for the most part, uh, they kind of lay the eggs and go about their business. I was going to I was going to say in a, in a broader sense in a ecosystem, say in a forest, uh, as we heard the uh, speakers on the panel talk about a, a few weeks ago. Uh, there's growing evidence uh, now that. Uh, in the ecosystems, organisms are, are are cooperating so much now that that itself is becoming a, a, a survival advantage, you know, and, and perpetuates the species. I'm sure, and yeah. uh, trees uh, communicate and and, and share uh, chemicals through their roots, you know, and the uh, canopy space, you know, is allocated based on. Uh, 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 sunlight available, and, and there's just so much evidence now that uh, shows you, you know, that cooperation is an underlying principle in yeah. ecosystems. Even the cooperation through the root systems fr mm -hmm. from one tree to the next. I mean, it is just, it, it is incre incredible what happens in plants. You, you think of a plant as something that is, just doesn't have that kind of sophisticated communication, but it does, they do. And, and that is just what is mind blowing, I think right now for me. I'm thinking about uh, the idea of social cooperation. And, you know, we've all, we've talked about uh, forest bathing. And so uh, when you are walking through the forest, uh, I was reading the other day, uh, Julie helped me remember the term phytoncides. Is that the, the term that uh, trees emit chemicals uh -huh. uh, to protect themselves from um, insects, whatever. And apparently humans breathing that in uh, then helps them develop cells that produce um, uh, the, uh, shoot, the white blood cells, the, the killer cells, they call them natural killer cells. Yeah. that help protect yeah. us mm -hmm. from, uh, thank you, from disease. And so now that we're learning about this, perhaps then we will cooperate more with the trees and here. <laughs> <laughs> increase our chances of survival and the trees' chances of survival. Uh, so social cooperation. Yes, yes. Good point, Nancy, thank you. We're all part of this big ecosystem of Earth yeah. anyway, you know? Yeah. yeah, it's one big cooperative system. Mm -hmm. Well, that, 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 that was derived through billions of years of evolution, I'm gonna point out, but anyway, go ahead, Sue. <laughs> when I was really young, I guess, what, in my 20s, we lived in Durham and on this circle, uh, you know, there were trees in the yard, lots of trees, and the neighbors were cutting down all these pine trees in their front yard. And I got so upset. I called Harriet work and said, uh, the children says they're cutting their trees down in their yard. And Harry said, Sue, what can I do about it? It's not my tree. <laughs> and I just felt so connected to my to those trees in our neighborhood that I just, I got really upset. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I, we're I had... all really, well, one time, and I'll do it quick. One time we had this wonderful retreat. A lot of, of you will remember it at Buffalo Mountain. Maybe Gary and Nancy were leading it. I don't know. But what we did, we were to go out in the forest by ourselves and find a special place that was special to us and connect to that and hug the trees or whatever we did in that moment of silence by ourselves. And see, I remember that well. It was a very special experience. Mm -hmm. 
Well, yes. Connecting with nature. That's mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't it? Well, I, I'm looking at the clock. I hate to end this. This is uh, just fascinating and wonderful. But uh, we're about out of time. Any parting words? Thank you for doing this. Thank you, folks. Thank you, folks. Thank you so much. Maybe next year we'll do it in person. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. And I would call on Ginger at this point if uh, Ginger has a blessing for us. I do, a little bit lighter note. And All for right. those that have Irish genes running through their body, <laughs> may the neighbors respect you, trouble neglect you, the angels protect you. May your pockets be heavy and your heart be light and good luck pursue you from morning to night. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. That's a great one, Ginger. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, thank y'all for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good Sunday, everyone.